Well, let's talk a little bit about the Kennedy presidency, which really um, got off to an auspicious beginning on, on his inauguration on January 20th, 1961, when he famously said this. The energy, the faith, the devotion, which we bring to this endeavor, will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And in short order, he started outlining ways that the whole country could work together in service to mankind. Ideas such as the Peace Corps, in which young people could volunteer to travel around the world and not kill or destroy, but rather to help people. And also uh, the uh, challenge that he gave to the country so far as the space race. Remember, the, uh, the Soviets had gotten a big head start on that. It had dispirited a lot of Americans. Kennedy was saying, you know what? We're going to catch up and we are going to surpass them. And he guaranteed the nation that there would be a man on the moon by the end of the decade and that America would put him there. Not only was the new president as youthful and energetic as his words were, but his wife, Jackie, did not look like or act like uh, first ladies generally had tended to look and act, which is, you know, not meant to be unfair to those first ladies. They were all middle-aged women because their husbands were middle-aged men. Uh, but uh, Jackie Kennedy was, like her husband, much younger, and like her husband, glamorous. She could have, uh, she could have been a fashion model. Perhaps you're aware that the Kennedy administration was sometimes referred to as Camelot. And if so, maybe you know why that is, and, and, and maybe you don't. Camelot, of course, in, uh, in British mythology is the, uh, the mystical homeland of King Arthur. Uh, but this is not going back to, uh, you know, 12th century uh, literature. This, is, uh, this was a musical that came out in 1960, the same year as the presidential election, and which happened to be the favorite a musical of John F. Kennedy, and he went to see it over and over again. And in part because of that association, and in part because of the plot of the movie, a lot of the American public began to associate the Kennedys with Camelot. Now here in this picture, you've got on the left the, uh, the original cast from the uh, 1960 production, with Bob Goulet standing as Sir Lancelot, and Julie Andrews as, uh, as Lady Guinevere and Richard Burton as King Arthur. Uh, King Arthur later played on stage and screen by Richard Harris there in the, the lower right, alias the original Dumbledore. And so the, the plot is that there's this uh, young king who comes to the throne and he's extremely idealistic. And his idealism is all about using might to do right. Not might is right, but might for right. And he designs this idea of a round table for his knights so that everyone will be equal and there will be no hierarchies. And he has all these plans, uh, these idealistic uh, plans for what to do with his country. And that fit right in with the glamorous image of the Kennedys, who seemed like a king and queen to some people. Now, if this, uh, if this analogy were carried all the way through, and if people had kind of thought ahead a little bit, if you're familiar with the play or the story of King Arthur, you know the idealistic young king um, 
is 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 uh, tragically killed at a young age. But uh, anyhow, uh, there you go, Camelot. Well, right away, Kennedy inherits uh, a major problem, a uh, new communist country right on the back doorstep, just off the coast of Florida, that is Cuba, which um, in 1959 had been the location of a revolution led by Fidel Castro, which had overthrown the leadership of the country and set up a, uh, a communist government in its place. Now, President Eisenhower suspended relations with Cuba when the uh, Castro government took over, and that stayed in place for decades, um, almost 50 years, I think. Uh, President Obama rolled some of that back, and then Trump came along and rolled some of it back forward. Who knows where it's going to wind up? Anyway, before Kennedy took office, the CIA I know this is gonna. I know this is gonna come as a shock. The CIA had already started planning uh, an invasion, uh, a, a counter revolution that they were going to uh, secretly sponsor. Okay, uh, so that was already underway when Kennedy took office. Uh, he just happened to be there when it was implemented. The plan was to have a small army of Cuban refugees who had fled the island. Uh, who had fled the communist control of the island and come to Florida and wanted to liberate their country from Fidel Castro to train them and arm them and drop them off in Cuba where they would then storm ashore and start a counter-revolution and all the people would come flock to them and they would overthrow the communists. Um, if they knew their history, they would have been familiar with uh, almost 100 years earlier when the uh, various American investors of Narciso Lopez had tried to do the same thing, and it turned out the same way, which is to say, not well. Same thing happened at the Bay of Pigs, which is where the uh, uh, CIA uh, advisors and the, uh, the Cuban counter-revolutionaries landed. Same thing happened that had happened a century earlier. The people did not flock to the counter-revolution because they didn't want to get shot. Uh, and the whole thing was just a disaster. Um, oddly enough, exactly as the one 100 years before. Anyway, uh, it was a disaster. Most of those uh, uh, invaders, those American-backed invaders, were either killed or captured. And right off the bat, it made Kennedy look really bad, it made him look incompetent. Uh, although, to be fair to him, it was already well planned out by the time he took over. Well, I get, again, I know this is going to surprise you, but the CIA followed that up since the invasion didn't work and the coup didn't work by attempting to assassinate Fidel Castro repeatedly, uh, several times in several different ways, none of which worked. The most creative one was literally they, uh, they slipped him an exploding cigar. Uh, that was meant to blow his head off, but uh, didn't happen. Then, in October 1962, the U.S. discovered, through the use of spy planes, that the Soviets had installed missiles on the island of Cuba, again, just off the coast of Florida. Those missiles, if launched, would be able to very quickly strike, um, unlike, you know, if they were launched from across the ocean, which would give the United States time to, to react. And you can see here the uh, range of those missiles. They could essentially, um, they could hit any place other than the West Coast from where they were, which was obviously very problematic. This led to a showdown between John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, who was uh, still in charge over in the Soviet Union. A blockade was placed around Cuba of American ships to prevent Soviet ships from, uh, from getting there. And the demand was made by President Kennedy that those missiles be removed. It was a very tense 
standoff. We now know, there was no way of knowing at the time, but you know, when the Cold War ended and we got access, at least briefly, to Soviet era documents, we now know that those Soviet ships included nuclear submarines. And if Kennedy had authorized planes to go and bomb Cuba to destroy those missiles, the Russians had been authorized to launch their nuclear missiles at the United States. So it was that close to nuclear annihilation. And it was like a massive, it was like a massive uh, poker game, a massive standoff in which the, uh, you know, the goal was to see who would blink first. And it could have gone very badly. President Kennedy um, had, well, he struck the perfect balance between not pushing too hard and therefore initiating what he was trying to avoid, but also not backing down at all. And so eventually a compromise was reached. Turns out the United States had missiles just like that in Turkey, where they could quickly strike the Soviet Union. So the uh, the final decision was, you move yours and we'll move ours, and then we'll both, you know, pretend everything's okay. So that's what happened. Uh, but people who were living in the uh, U.S., all, actually all around the world, knew this was going on. And it was a scary, scary time. Um, a lot has been made of the fact, and we haven't really talked about it here yet, that uh, John F. Kennedy was an even worse husband than Martin Luther King was. He engaged in many, many affairs uh, flagrantly, and uh, he was just terrible when it came to that sort of thing. And that is indefensible. That is not right. That's the sort of thing that uh, society rightly frowns upon. But when it comes to the office of president, I feel like I would much rather have had John F. Kennedy there that day than Richard Nixon, who, so far as anyone knows, had never cheated on his wife or, well, he did lots of immoral things, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't one of them. My point is, my point is, I think we were fortunate in how that 1960 election turned out because Nixon is not known, was not known for his tactfulness. He was not known for his diplomacy. He was not known for his self-restraint and self-control. So anyhow, it turned out okay. Another problem that Kennedy inherited was the situation in Vietnam, which, if you will recall, had been divided into North and South with Ho Chi Minh, the, uh, the communist leader in charge in the North, and No Dinh Diem, America's guy, in charge in the South. Now, Eisenhower, by the late 50s, we'll talk about this later, had already started sending military advisors to Vietnam. Well, turns out, no Dinh Diem, who was uh, a very uh, staunch and faithful Catholic, um, wasn't real good on religious tolerance, particularly with the Buddhist monks in, uh, in his country. And he began cracking down on them, suppressing uh, the monks, and in protest, maybe you've uh, seen the pictures, I won't show one here, but uh, some of those monks started protesting by lighting themselves on fire and calmly burning to death in the streets, which uh, will get attention and which inflamed, no pun intended, that just kind of turned out that way, inflamed the uh, Buddhist population of the country and made them furious, but uh, Zim was not backing off and the U.S. advisors from the State Department advised him to break out, to, to back off, and he didn't. He clamped down further. Then they sort of very strongly advised him to back off, and he didn't. Then they pretty much told him to, 
and he didn't. Now, the whole point of having him in charge, really, was that he would do what the U.S. told him to. And now here he was, totally disregarding the State Department and creating all kinds of conflict in South Vietnam. Remember, the reason the U.S. had not wanted there to be a uh, countrywide election in Vietnam back in the 50s was because Ho Chi Minh had so much support in the South, he probably would have won. So there's a lot of pro-Ho Chi Minh people, and ticking them off, particularly where religion was concerned, was a good way to disrupt the whole thing, to upset the apple cart. So, and I know this is going to shock you, the CIA backed a coup against No Den Ziem, their own guy, um, the person that they had put in place, uh, in which he was overthrown and he and his brother were executed. And someone else was put in charge who hopefully, at least from the point of view of the State Department, would be more cooperative. Now, so far as I know, there has been no evidence that Kennedy had authorized this action, and there's even some evidence he may not have known about it. Now, that's scary either way, right? If he did know about it and authorized it, um, that's, that's a pretty scary proposition. If he didn't even know about it, and this is going on without the president's knowledge, that shows just how much power the CIA and the State Department could have had. Well, spoiler alert, things are going to get a whole lot hotter in South Vietnam before that decade was over. It's really hard to talk too much or for too long about the accomplishments of President Kennedy during his administration, because he was only in office for two and a half years, a little more, but roughly two and a half years. Uh, as you know, his presidency was tragically cut short in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, when an assassin's bullet ended his life. This is a photograph from later that day when Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson was sworn in as President of the United States on Air Force One, standing next to a, uh, a very dazed and in shock First Lady, now former First Lady Jackie Kennedy, who had uh, still had her husband's uh, blood and brains on her coat. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. Well, let's talk a little bit about Lyndon Baines Johnson former senator from Texas. We've talked about him several times already, and I've pointed out that he was known for being the kind of politician who played hardball. He could be very, he could be very rough. He could be demanding. He could sometimes be cruel in trying to uh, get people to do what he wanted them to do. He also was extremely coarse and vulgar, and he swore like a sailor, and if you're, if you're interested on YouTube, you can find uh, a conversation he had one time when he was ordering pants from a tailor that was uh, recorded uh, from the Oval Office that is just hilarious in its vulgarity. And he sometimes used the kind of, uh, kind of racialized language that you would expect of a white person that uh, grew up in Texas in the 19-teens and 1920s. But there was also a lot more to him than that. When he was a young man in the 1920s, he was a school teacher in Texas, and he himself had grown up in extreme poverty. 
and his experiences in his in his youth and his young adulthood would uh, would impact a lot of the things that he did later in life. And uh, I want you to listen to this little excerpt of a speech of his in which he talks about that and bear it in mind when you think about any of the things that he did afterward or some of the things he did before. Remember, he is one of the three Southern senators who refused to sign the Southern Manifesto. My first job after college was as a teacher in Petula, Texas, in a small Mexican-American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. And they knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them. But they knew it was so, because I saw it in their eyes. I often walked home late in the afternoon after the classes were finished, wishing there was more that I could do. But all I knew was to teach them the little that I knew, hoping that it might help them against the hardships that lay ahead. And somehow you never forget what poverty and hatred can do when you see its scars on the hopeful face of a young child. I never thought then, in 1928, that I would be standing here in 1965. It never even occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and to help people like them all over this country. But now I do have that chance. And I'll let you in on a secret. I mean to use it. summer of 1963, in June, around the time that he had, uh, he had given that civil rights speech on television, President Kennedy had proposed legislation to, uh, to back it up, legislation that would outlaw segregation in, in school or in uh, employment or in public spaces, and that would essentially outlaw discrimination based on based on race, ethnicity, and similar factors. However, the legislation that he proposed had not gotten anywhere. It was filibustered on the uh, floor of the Senate and stalled. Well, when Johnson took over, he started pressing hard for that uh, Civil Rights Act. Um, and in fact, he, uh, he framed it as the perfect tribute to President Kennedy. The whole nation was mourning uh, deeply the, the death of, of this president, who, if you'll recall, had barely won the election. But once in office, uh, well, you know, even, even then there was a lot of uh, um, anti-Kennedy feeling, obviously, but um, especially on the part of at least one person, right? But... Um, the nation, the, the very fact, even if they hadn't voted for him, the fact that the president had been had been murdered, really, made uh, made people romanticize him even more. And Johnson used that to push forward the legislation that both he and Kennedy had supported, and and it worked. It was passed, and he signed it into law, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. One of the things that he said in pushing for it was, we've talked long enough about equal rights in this country. It's now time to write the next chapter 
and write it in the books of law. However, after it passed and he had signed it into law, he made the comment that uh, he said, uh, I think we have delivered the South to the Republican Party for at least a generation. What did he mean by that? Well, Democrats in the South, and practically everyone in the South was a Democrat, uh, Democrats were in favor, for the most part, of segregation. And that's not just uh, Democratic politicians, that's Democratic voters were in favor of protecting segregation. Now, it's been ended by a Democratic president. His prediction was, next time around, those white Southerners won't vote for the Democrats anymore. And remember, they had been the solid South for, at this point, uh, well over a century. Well, I wonder if what he predicted was true. Take note of it when we look at subsequent presidential elections. Take note of it, in fact, still today.